Hello, I'm Joseph, and today I want to talk about my experience with Nux 3. This is just for some background. I have over two decades of, of experience, both in, uh, that's 20 years plus, but that's in web development, desktop, mobile app, all this other stuff. I previously have used Next.js and stopped using it because of just the amount of changes they introduce in every release. And I was getting really frustrated Then pushing a reverse cell uh, on top of that and, and like breaking features. I was getting really upset. So I moved over to Nux 3 um, in that time frame. So it's been over a year plus now. I used it when it was back in beta candidate releases and it's final release and then through on through all that. Um, overall, I've been pretty happy. But first, I'm going to go over my website, just some quick features real quick so you get some context and then go over the issues I've had over the years. Okay, so first, let's go over my website. Um, this is just a, a site about pen tablets. So it has a, like 100 plus in the database. Fairly straightforward, pretty simple. You click on a product, look at it. You can um, look at the comparison of products here. And then there's a complete admin backend system. All this backend code is written in Nux as well, at least my Nux project. The cool thing about that is that it's separate from Nux in that uh, it's dependent on some other thing. And I'll, I'll go into that later. So I have a complete admin. Uh, you can log in, you can create your own account, that type of thing. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have other little features. You can see all of them by pictures if you wanted to. You can change from grams to ounces, uh, inches to centimeters, some type like that. So these change on the fly on that. It also has um, uh, like looks at the user's thing for like dark mode, which is pink for me. <laughs> so, but it only works on um, the the dynamic pages because it's a server side rendering on this this set here. It'll only pick up what was last there, uh, so it doesn't stick. Um, because it is server-side rendered. Okay, so that's just the, the background context of it. The first thing I want to show as a, like a pr potential problem that I have, and I actually need to stop this and run my dev server instead, is that um, there is an error that I will get called a 500 error, which is about the most annoying error I can possibly get because it sometimes gives me zero information about what is going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to my page here and introduce this error. This was a this is another problem that I'll get into later. But let's say I make some error or issue with TypeScript and then I go over here and I refresh this. I get a 500 error. And there's there's no backtrace, there's nothing. If I go into here, try to see what the error is, nothing. So there are debug tools and tell me what's going on. Uh, and I have no idea other than this is not found. This could be in some sub file of some TypeScript that I've in, uh, included or um, in some other place. I just have no idea. Um, just for some context of why this is showing is that this is server-side rendering. This is a server-side rendering error, and I can't really tell you what is going on. Well, maybe it can, but at least from what my experience, it can't. So I'm over there like start plucking away at what the potential issue is. Um, so not always enjoyable. This won't always happen every single time. Sometimes it'll tell you the exact line of it. Um, so if I do, I don't know, that, and then I refresh it. Obviously, then I get it. Like I get the exact error what's happening. It just there are some minute errors that I will run into that doesn't really tell me exactly why that's happening. Another error I ran into that was a little bit of weird that gave me um, a problem. If I reintroduce it here and I go to Problo and I go to um, the S pager. So if I click this first, nothing happens, but the URL changed. So if I then enter, and then shows me this. Now, previously it wasn't getting this backtrace and that's because I used this for such an early uh, onboarding process with Nux that it didn't have a, just a debug tool enabled. So I went ahead and downloaded it, set it up, and now I get a backtrace, but you can see the backtrace is showing on a .js file at line 141, which obviously doesn't reference my exact code. Um, so then if you go here and you look at it, it says, oh, well it is on view, but it's also line 141. So um the the problem with that if if i it takes me here by the way if i go to line 141 uh it's it's this bit bit of code here which has nothing about dot replace in it um that specific issue has to do with the uh this here this description because this has dot replace and description is null because it wasn't provided for this product it throws that error but it's it's at line four not 141 and I like I'm just start plucking away. Is this in this component? Is this some other subcomponent that I have? 
where everywhere they have a dot replace now i need to start you know uncommenting and commenting to figure out what is what is happening so this is i guess maybe my edge case but this is kind of my biggest issue currently with with nux is that you still run into these 500 errors where you just have no idea why this is happening um and more specific to some of the the, the type issues that i was that i was referencing okay so that's that the other thing i need to reference as a as a problem is that just to give you some context here they have a server side thing so of h3 h3 is ex like kinned to express js or any other type of like web framework that you would do in Node.js or in, in JavaScript land. And so when you go to that side here, let's say my image upload process here, um, there's nothing here that references any view code. There's nothing in here that references anything from um, Nitro. It's just H3. So it's completely isolated and separate, which is great. But because this is all coupled together with Nux, they have done uh, updates to H3 that have been breaking changes that Nux does not tell you up front. And so I've had to rewritten this backend code, while not that much, um, about three times now, because they've, I went from a 0, 0.0 release of H3 to a 1.0 release of H3 to a 1.6 version of H3. And every single one of those releases have broken my backend code where uh, something has changed. Either the event has changed or how I return a stream has changed or return uploaded code or I need to do something asynchronous and then re return with an asynchronous result. All that has changed between all those different versions and has been anno annoyed me to know to all end. It has stopped doing this now. They, it's more subtle, but um have being that volatile when when early adopting and then being for the initial releases hasn't been that that great but that's that's the line um the other thing i need to talk about is i guess they're it's it's a bit nuanced but they have these blog entries they they detail out in very good detail uh all their updates so if you go to 3.10 you kind of see all the little stuff here really cool and stuff like that um i like it i like it a lot but I've, I've come from PHP world and I'm specifically Laravel when they do their releases and their like migration guide and stuff like that, they tell you upfront, what is a breaking change and what is not they, And they, they tell you that in a way that is high impact, medium impact and low impact changes that they have done. So you can go to their high impact because that's usually what's going to be breaking. Nux doesn't really do this. And so my, my issue was like, I skipped over a couple releases cause there was nothing new that I really need it. But I, I skipped all the way to 3.10. And when I did that, I had that 500 error. That that one that had said, you know, uh, not found, whatever, previous before this with no backtrace. And I had no idea what's going on. So I tried downgrading the 3.9, 3.8, and it was still there. I'm like, what is going on? Like, what did I do to break this? And I tried to leave my package, what uh, package.lock file. And so then I went down to 3.8. I read the entire release log and at the very bottom, there's this bit here, which is this little red alert thing. And then it tells you, oh, by the way, if you're importing an interface in TypeScript, you now need a reference type in the import process. If you want to bypass it, you can bypass it with this. Um, now I have like 40 plus files I had to go and do all these changes to. I don't mind doing these changes. That's not my complaint. It's that I had no idea this is the problem and having to go through multiple releases, going and reading all of it just to figure out, oh, this is the problem. Because I, I tried to go into like the issue tracker and there's nothing in issues I could find. And it's just this, it's, it's this little minor thing. I, I prefer them to, you know, put up front, hey, by the way, this is a high impact change that will likely need changes to your code base at the very top of the blog post. That, that's, that's all I would like. Um, the last little thing that is going to be a little bit of a deep dive into how uh, their pages work. Let me just make sure I, I fix this issue here. So this is a, a little bit of a, how this works is they have multiple modes you can do for rendering your routes. So you're not locked into like a spa app for the entire application. You're not locked into server-side rendering for the entire application. You're not locked into hybrid mode for your entire application. You can choose which route. So they kind of give you a better explanation. I'm going to go to my Nuxi config and you can see it right here. So I have routes defined. 
And these up here are all saying these are going to be static pages. And in fact, I can go to the HTML of these static pages in my output. So if you want to serve this via Apache or um, Nginx, you can do that. I have my privacy and in my privacy, there's an HTML file. They also have some exp experimental things to completely exclude out any reference to any JavaScript. So you can, you can get all, all this script code and everything else. It'll just be a complete static HTML. Uh, with an experimental flag if you really, really want to do that. Uh, but those are pre-rendered. I have SSS, uh, SSR, so server-side render turned off for the admin section, for the account section, for the authentication, the login, register, that type of stuff. Because there's nothing there I'd really technically want to cache through HTML. I'd rather it always be pulled via the client uh, side rendering of things. Uh, there's no benefit for SEO for that. And then there's this bit here, and this is the bit that I want to focus on. So this is server side rendering with uh, time to live or just do it once. So it's like dynamically, so it's not like built on build, it's built on demand, um, which is good for like a CMS system. If you have these dynamic pages where you want the HTML to be served via server side, but you want it to be cached. So here it's cached and it's, it'll never do any uh any um, client side rendering at all. It's it's just completely static HTML. Here I can do dynamic stuff like pull in maybe some related products and stuff like that. And so the kind of best way I can explain this is that if I view this page source, this HTML that you see here is all statically generated and cached. So when I refresh this, it's never going to change for the next 24 hours. So what I have defined it in seconds here. If I set this to true, It'll stay cached for the entire runtime of the application. If I restart this for do a new build process, then it'll re-update re the cache, but you have that time to live. This is where I wish it would change a little, but it's not that big of a deal because while this is all static HTML, which is what you see here, there's a rehydration process that happens to when, when I load up this page, it actually pulls dynamically from the client side code that I have here now to rehydrate this page. And I'm not doing anything special. Any of the code that runs on server runs on the client. It just rehydrates it. So if I go and I log into my admin here and I go to the pen tablet section. Oh gosh, this is difficult to read. Let me, let me go to a different page here then. Uh, Cause I can't read anything at all. So let's go to this. All right. Uh, I'm just going to go this super quick. So let's say uh, this says six. So you see it says six here. Um, if I go and I view the page source, so I go to view, view source, you're going to see six there. Actually, this shouldn't be that like that. Okay. Let me, let me redo this. View page source, find, you can, so you see it there, right? Six. So if I go here and I change this to sixes and I, and I go down here and save it, um, and I refresh this here, it still says six, right? So that, that's the intent of it caching. But the catch is when I go here and I refresh it, and now it says sixes, even though in the HTML, it still says six. So you, you get the cache on the server served to you for the next 24 hours that will say that specific edit, which is, which is fine for me. Uh, but on the client, which I think is the most important part. You're getting the most recent update for it because it rehydrates the page based off the stuff that I'm doing. So it's intentionally a good thing, but I really wish I had a way to break the server, the, the cache on the server side of things um, with a cache tag or something. And they have a different implementation of ISR, incremental static rendering that's used for Vercel and Netify, but I have no way to hook into that myself. So that's the the general idea that's my only last little gripe with nux that i really wish would be implemented everything else has been really really cool up front till then one other little minor thing if you're doing routes and you're overriding some um uh, nitro stuff one thing i ran into was it would um it wouldn't this would no longer apply the routes that i defined here wouldn't um cache properly because night i had some nitro configuration that was um, not overriding the route specifically, but we're still impacting it. And then I had another issue where, um, when I was doing some custom nitro configuration in here, when I say nitro, what I, what I mean is in this configuration, you can actually type in, uh, nitro, there you go. 
and then you declare your things here, like pre-render, that type of stuff. But if I, if I included that at all, the build process would never finish. It would get like hung on the build. And that would have been only happening on a newer version of, of uh, Nux. You also can't do any type of like asynchronous defined Nux config. So if you wanted to load up all these routes based off a database, you need to do this in a separate build and then include like the JSON result of that into this file and spit it out here. That's my only little thing, but that's it. Everything else has been fine for me. I've been very happy with it. We're just some cool stuff in here. So for example, all this admin section, this drop down, this account things. Um, when you're building out these components, which I feel, like I said, it feels like you're not, you're not even really doing any work here to define what's server side and what's not. There's there's some instances, so like the site header has um, this uh, client only tag. So you can declare that. So if you need to do something to rehydrate on a client and you don't want the server to pick it up, you can you can lock it off to a client only section with a fallback of what the server will render. So if you don't want it to render nothing, then or or you want to run some specific thing, you can do a fallback. So here I just say login. So the server will always assume that you're not logged in, render this, and then when it gets to the client, it will rehydrate it with this stuff here based off your your authentication role of admin or not. And then uh, if you are not logged in, then show the login page, that type of thing. So same thing here where I'm pulling from. Um, local storage for this this thing here and so i can't actually render it on the on the server side I, I really do need to only render this on the client because i'm pulling from local storage and not from a cookie for a cookie you can have available on the server local storage is client only so that that's why i'm having this here as well so kind of get that there really really like how nux is kind of laid out you, it's just view. Like for me, I don't really notice it. There's some caveats that when you pull in, let me go to a different thing. Rather, let's go to a page instead here. Actually, let's go to the index here. So when you when you're pulling specific like Nux things, you have this uh, this reference to like Nux apps or use route, use router, that type of thing. So if you need to do these on both server side and client side, it's just transparent as long as you're using nux app stuff to do these things like routing and like handling cookies and some other stuff it just works on both sides things like fetching if you want to do with data fetch on the client data fetch on the server you use dollar sign fetch so that type of thing and this works on both i don't have to worry about one they have like use async fetch and some other things like that um overall like i said really really happy i'm glad i switched over because now i'm not doing dealing with all this more uh, complicated stuff specifically for things where I previously wanted like a completely static site and uh, Next.js was making that so much more harder. Nux is giving me that opportunity now, at least now that they have a full static site renderer implemented on release they didn't. Um, and I, I can do a full complete backend experience. Great for building out CMSs that you want that dynamic list in there. And um, you get that great performance of that statically served site with the rehydration if you need it for product pages and stuff like that. Yeah, it's great. So if you have any questions about Nux, leave them down below. I'll try to answer them as I can. But till then, take care.